All right, everybody, it's the moment you've been waiting for. Welcome. I am Matthew Ross, the Director of Continuing Education at Longwood Gardens in Kennett Square and a national board member with Wild Ones. On behalf of the board, we want to start the evening by thanking you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to make a point of being with us all tonight. We are glad to have so many of you joining us from across the nation, and we're encouraging you to share tonight's message with the members of your Wild Ones group that couldn't attend, and also use this as a way of sharing your passion and the importance of native plants with your friends, colleagues, and neighbors that may not currently be involved in the native plant movement. As a reminder, we do have a series of questions that you all submitted before tonight's lecture, and we will answer them time permitting at the end of the talk. During the duration of the talk, please remain muted in order for the best experience for your fellow attendees and out of respect for our speaker tonight. Feel free to let us know who you are and where you're joining us from during today's poll questions. So we'll have a couple of poll questions that'll pop up. Feel free to answer those as we move through tonight's introduction and then throughout the presentation at the very end, we'll share some data about where everybody's from, how they're connected to wild ones, and hopefully have a time for Heather to see everybody's faces at the very end, we'll, we'll allow you to turn back on your video feed. But for right now, please turn off your video feed and mute your microphones. I now have the distinct pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker, Heather Holm. She's a noted author and celebrated expert of our native bees and other pollinators. Heather is an advocate for the world of native pollination and is a lecturer and author that truly bridges the divide between ecology, horticulture, and design. She's an award-winning author having penned two impressive books, Pollinators of Native Plants in 2014 and Bees. I know a book is near and dear to my heart that I have on my desk that I hope you all do too. And that book was published in 2017. It later rightfully received praise from the American Horticulture Society and other organizations receiving a total of six awards. It's truly the most comprehensive guide to our native bees that's out there. And we're very excited for her to share about one section of that book on Bombus. Heather is the newest honorary board member joining the likes of Doug Tallamy, Neil Dibel, Donna Van Buchen, and the inspiration for wild ones, the late Laureato. If you've ever had the pleasure of hearing Heather present, her passion is contagious and her message is one that resonates across the spectrum from home gardener to practitioner, land steward to farmer. I encourage you to check out the various Facebook groups that Heather is involved in, including the Pollinators Native Plants group, where she shares tips from the field on how to attract and build a landscape that encourages pollinators to take residence in your garden. Without further ado, I welcome Heather home as she presents the Bombus Among Us Bumblebee Basics. Pam, if you could unmute Heather and we'll get started. Great, it looks like I'm unmuted. Well, thanks very much, Matt, for the introduction and for everyone joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to be presenting as the new honorary director for Wild Ones. I'm also involved in a local Wild Ones chapter in where I live in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And Wild Ones is a great organization. If uh, you've never heard of it or this is the first time you're learning about it, I encourage you to connect with your local chapter by visiting the Wild Ones website to find out uh, what chapter is in your area. So tonight I'm gonna be talking about one sort of narrow section of native bees, our, our charismatic and um, bumblebees. I often think of them as you know, our cuddly teddy bears of, of the native bee world. And they're very endearing and one of the nice things about bumblebees is um, they're very easy for people to identify. So even if someone who doesn't really know anything about bees, if you ask them to name three kinds of bees, uh, bumblebees would be usually one of those three in the list that they, they tell you. So 
They are uh, easily recognizable. We have a few uh, bee species such as the large carpenter bee that can look similar and sometimes some, some types of flies that are bumblebee mimics. But for the most part, um, they're a great place to start, especially if you're just getting into bees and are interested in learning more about identifying bees. Uh, bumblebees are a wonderful place to start. So tonight's presentation, I'll be getting in depth and detail about bumblebees, their life cycle. And I wanna emphasize, and I'm hopefully, hopefully I'll do so, um, how that all relates to what's going on in, in our gardens and landscapes that we're managing. So the reason I'm gonna give you so much life cycle information is it's really about the seasonality and, and your own observations of when you're seeing bumblebees, what are their needs at a particular time of year. And I'm gonna finish off the presentation. I'm just gonna to touch on some of those bumblebee ID things to get you started, featuring three or four common species and, and what to look for and how to use guides. And then we'll be also throughout the presentation, I'm going to be weaving in specific plants. Matthew will be uh, either posting some resource links that I've provided or uh, the Wild Ones folks will be following up and sending you the resource links. And that's one of, one of my last slides. So if you, I may skip over it quickly, but don't worry, you'll get that information. So just talking in general about bee diversity, many people are just unaware of how many different kinds of bee species we have here in North America, North of Mexico. And the approximate number is close to 4,000 species. So to give you some perspective, uh, the honeybee, which is a single species in North America, is just one out of the 4,000. Uh, I live in Minnesota and we're a fairly large state. So we have over 450 species. Last night I gave a presentation to a plant organization in Massachusetts and Massachusetts has uh, 150. It's really dependent on uh, and I will also say, I'm not going to read any of these. You can, okay, you watch it's really dependent positive. on um, the size of the state and the, the biomes and all those other factors will determine uh, how many bubble or bee species you may have. So you can see on my slide here, in the United States, we have 51 species. 21 of those occur in the eastern U.S. So for those of you that are living in the Midwest like I am, uh, we tend to straddle both the eastern and western species, so we pick up a few more. Um, so, for example, in, in Minnesota, we have 23 species. All right, there we go. Oh, yeah, All right, so as a native bee advocate, sometimes my job can be quite difficult because the general public tends to base their knowledge around how a honeybee behaves. And honeybees are actually an introduced species to North America. They're, they're, you can think of them as a domesticated species. And they were actually introduced in the early 1600s, 1630s is the approximate date that they were brought over from Europe to, to North America. So their lifestyle and what makes my job difficult is their lifestyle is very, very different than most of our native bees. Honeybees are highly social. Um, part of that sociality is due to their domestication. They live in our northern temperate climates in managed hives. And each hive can contain anywhere from 10 to 50,000 bees. So that's a lot of bees living together. And if the hive survives the winter, uh, typically honeybees are perennial. So that queen can live a very long time doing all the primary egg laying. Now you compare that with most of our native bees, 90% of them have a solitary lifestyle. So it's just a single female bee that's actively looking for a place to nest, going to flowers and making many trips back and forth to collect pollen and nectar, bringing those materials to the nest that she's prepared, and then laying eggs. So she's doing all the work that would happen in um, a social honeybee hive of many many bees dividing up the labor. Now of the 100% of native bees, 10% uh, that are, are social and that's where bumblebees fall in and that's what we'll be talking about tonight. 
Uh, we also have some sweat bees that have a social lifestyle, but our bumblebees are probably our most social native bee that we have here in North America. Now, in comparison, their colonies that they produce are very tiny in comparison to honeybees. So a single bumblebee colony may produce as uh, anywhere from 200 to maybe 800 bumblebees in one growing season. So that's a big, big difference than a honeybee hive where there's 10 to 50,000 bees. And so I just want to touch on a few things to look for outside of the bumblebee world, but also um, this is related to bumblebees. And I want to talk about just basic pollen collection and pollinator observation. So if you're just starting out, uh, one of the things to understand is it's just the female bees that have some kind of pollen collecting structure on their body. They, or I call them the grocery bags. So the females are doing all the grocery shopping uh, while the males uh, don't help at all with grocery shopping. So they have usually have external structures on their body to pack and carry pollen as, as they are visiting flowers. So the couple of ways that are shown here on the slide, we have um, bees in a family called the leaf cutter bee family. They have rows of hairs on the bottom of their abdomen. So they're quite unusual. They, they collect and carry all the pollen on the bottom of their abdomen. Uh, most of our native bees, and this doesn't include bumblebees, have uh, hairs of bearing on their hind legs. So as they visit flowers, uh, their head, their thorax, their abdomen can get covered in pollen grains, but then they're doing a lot of grooming to get that pollen to uh, adhere to the hairs on their hind legs. And then in nature, of course, we always have exceptions to the rules. So we have these very tiny yellow-faced or mask bees that look like um, mason wasps. And you can see on that right picture, that female really has no hairs whatsoever on her body. So she's not actually collecting pollen externally. She, uh, she will consume the pollen and ingest it, store it in her crop, and then when she returns to the nest, she'll regurgitate that material combined, and it's combined with nectar. So she, she has a very different way of collecting pollen. Now, all of these pollen collecting strategies of just these three examples on this slide, uh, you can imagine that yellow-faced bees probably aren't very good pollinators. They uh, are not moving a lot of pollen around from flower to flower because they're ingesting it internally and they're not, they don't have structures on the body to have carry pollen. But you, the other two bees on this slide would be very effective and efficient pollinators in a given situation if they're transferring pollen from one native plant to another of the same species. Bumblebees do, do it a little bit differently though. And bumblebees have a pollen basket. It's also called a corbicula. So just the females have this pollen basket, the queens and the workers. And I call it the orange football. So it's a, you can see on my uh, blow up of that picture of the hind leg. It's a flared, uh, the tibia on the hind leg is flared and it's smooth. It has a smooth sort of concave indentation. And then it's surrounded with wiry bristly hairs. So as a bumblebee forages on a flower, and this is something I'll be talking about this evening in the presentation, um, bumblebees have nectar plants and bumblebees have plants that they purposefully collect pollen from. So when they're visiting a plant that they're purposely collecting pollen, similarly to those uh, other solitary bees I showed on the previous slide, uh, bumblebees are very hairy, so a lot of their hairs would get coated with pollen grains and they'd be doing a similar grooming to move those pollen grains back to the hind leg. What they often do is regurgitate a little bit of nectar as they're packing it onto that pollen basket. So I've, I've actually photographed bumblebee uh, workers where they have different colors of pollen sort of uh, in, in rows or layers on, on their pollen basket because they've visited uh, a number of different plant species. Uh, and then there's the other exception to the rule is cuckoo bees. Uh, so the, the one on the right is a nomadic cuckoo bee. It's a solitary bee. They're, it's not solitary. It's a bee that preys on solitary bees. And the cuckoo bees, we have a number of different genera that are cuckoo bees that have specific hosts. 
And they were named cuckoo bees by uh, Europeans when they came to North America because they were familiar with the cuckoo bird. And for those of you that are birders in the audience, um, the cuckoo bird is very, has a very similar MO as our North American cowbird. So the cowbirds don't uh, build or construct their own nest. They look for another bird actively laying eggs and, and um, sitting on a nest. They slip inside and lay their eggs. So that's what our cuckoo bees do. And so they will, the nomadic cuckoo bee that I haven't pictured on the right here, uh, they typically prey on ground nesting bees. So you'll see them perched low to the ground, monitoring the nests of a solitary ground nesting bee, uh, waiting for an opportunity to get inside the nest. But bumblebees also have cuckoo, bum, uh, cuckoo bees. And they have a little bit different strategy. And this one is the lemon cuckoo bumblebee I have pictured here, a female. Now they don't have any pollen collecting structures. And the reason is the females, they just have females and males. So they don't have the same um, hierarchy as a regular bumblebee, which would have a queen, workers, and males. So what the cuckoo bumblebees do is they typically emerge a little bit later than their host. And that timing allows their host to already have already established a nest and um, produce the first generation of offspring, which are all female. And that's the point in time that the cuckoo bumblebee will invade a nest um, through aggression or other means, either kill or drive out the host queen. And then she takes over the nest, starts doing her own egg laying to rear her own offspring. And again, through pheromones and sometimes aggression will convince the host worker bumblebees to rear her offspring. So uh, cuckoo bumblebees and similarly cuckoo bees can be an indication of what, um, that you have good bee diversity. And, and the second thing is that the host is present if you, if you see them. So I'm gonna get into why are bumblebees amazing and important? And there's a number of reasons. Um, Bumblebees, and I mentioned 51 species in the U.S. Uh, they occur in many different ecoregions, uh, including the Arctic. So you can imagine the very short growing season in the Arctic. And we have bumblebee species that are out for that short window of time while the plants are blooming in the Arctic to pollinate them. They are also a very significant pollinator of many of the agricultural crops that we depend on, particularly in the Eastern US. And native bees often don't get their due credit. Um, honeybees are often given all the credit for the pollination of our crops that we depend on. But bumblebees are very efficient and effective pollinators and I'll illustrate some reasons why. And one of those is that they, uh, bumblebees, as well as many of our other native bees, have the ability to buzz pollinate flowers. It's also called sonication. And buzz pollination uh, is required by some plants to, to exempt agricultural crops. I have pictured on this slide are cultivated blueberries and tomatoes. And cultivated blueberries um, have uh, anthers, the anthers are the male reproductive parts of the flowers that typically produce the pollen and the pollen is shed from the anthers. What's going on with many plants that require buzz pollination is those anthers are inverted or inside out and they will have uh, pores or valves, basically small openings that that pollen has to get shaken out of like salt from a salt shaker. So here in this picture is a queen bumblebee on the blueberry flower, and hopefully you can see the pollen flying. So what she's doing to make that buzz pollination mechanism is she's grasping a hold of the re male reproductive parts of the flower, either with her mandibles or sometimes, in some cases, her forelegs. And then all bees, uh, in particular bumblebees, have a very large muscle in the back of their thorax. It's their flight muscle. So they will vibrate that muscle at a really high frequency. So it's that vibration uh, mechanism that is the shaking mechanism that shakes pollen out of the flower. Why am I telling you all this? 
because honeybees, which are an introduced non-native species, uh, don't have the ability to buzz pollinate flowers. So many of the, again, many of the agricultural and crops that we depend on for human consumption are plants that require buzz pollination. And that's what makes bumblebees and some of our other native bees much more effective and efficient at buzz pollination because they can buzz pollinate the flower. And one study demonstrated that bumblebees, and also in part of that efficiency is you can imagine they, they fly to a cluster of uh, blueberry flowers, for example, buzz pollinate, which really doesn't take a lot of time. They do it very quickly. And buzz pollination extracts a significant amount of pollen, uh, maybe the equivalent to visiting many different flowering plants. So that's where the efficiency comes in. They can, a short buzz, extract a lot of pollen, and that makes them a lot faster and more efficient than the European honeybee that can't buzz pollinate the flower. So then in the same token, they're better at pollination because the, all of that pollen that they're extracting, they may not be collecting or grooming it all to their pollen baskets. So they're doing a very good job of transferring pollen from one blueberry flower to the next. Uh, similarly, because bumblebees can fly in cool temperatures, you think of some of the early fruit trees that bloom very early in the spring, sometimes where day temperatures are only in the 50s, that usually doesn't slow down some of the queen bumblebees. Because of their large size, they actually use that uh, flight vibratory mechanism or shivering to help them warm up. And then once they get going, they're able to fly in cool temperatures. Uh, similarly, they're a little bit better at uh, pollinating apples and it's based on their foraging behavior. They are consistently landing on the middle of the flower where the pollen is produced and that makes them better at transferring pollen from flower to flower. If you watch honeybees, they will tuck themselves into the side of the flower trying to sip on nectar and so they don't make as much contact with the pollen on the flower. And so this is why if I would say start with focusing on uh, bum, uh, attracting bumblebees and you can do so by having uh, a diversity of native flowering plants next to your vegetable garden or even combined with the vegetables that you're growing. Because they have a social lifestyle, uh, the colony is active or the individual bumblebees in a colony are active from sometimes mid-April all the way into October or, no or November. So there's a hundred percent overlap with these uh, crops that I have on this slide and bumblebees. We have other native bees that have very uh, narrow windows of time that they may be pollinators, such as mason bees. Mason bees are very good at pollinating some of our early spring flowering trees, such as apples and excuse me, cherries. But they have uh, a six week, life, six week lifespan. So they are very good at one thing, but they can't cover all of the uh, fruits and vegetables that uh, bumblebees can. And as I mentioned, they can forage in cool temperatures. And the other reason that they're good pollinators is they demonstrate floral constancy. And that is basically a type of fidelity where they visit the same flower type of or species of flowering plant um, as they go out and forage for the morning, for example. They'll, they'll hit the same species of plants. And that means they're covering themselves with one type of pollen and that the plants really like that because plants don't want to receive pollen from a completely different plant species. It tends to gum up the works and so they like when a bee is has fidelity and is transferring the right kind of pollen to to ensure that pollination occurs. Uh, bumblebees also have some of the longest tongues of our native bees. So start thinking about the flowering plants you're growing in your garden. You have you know, a variety of uh, open flower forms and complex flower forms. Uh, this bumblebee squeezing herself into this blue lobelia flower. She has the, the size and the strength to pry open the flower. And then the second piece is she has a long tongue. So it's no problem for her to sip on the nectar at the bottom of the flower where the nectaries occur. 
So getting into um, bee nutrition, and this doesn't just apply to bumblebees, this applies to all bees. And bees are uh, closely related to wasps. So if you think of thread-waisted wasps, um, for example, the great golden digger wasp or the great black wasp, their bees are closely related to that part of the wasp um, uh, hymenoptera tree. <laughs> and um, of course, they're not very much like wasps anymore. Um, bees have become very hairy for the most part. And the other significant di dis difference from their wasp cousins is their wasp cousins are carnivorous. Uh, those females are out hunting other insects to feed their offspring. And probably with the radiation of flowering plants, uh, bees decided that uh, flowering plants were providing a good nutritional source in the form of plant-based plant food, pollen and nectar. So they have basically become vegetarian and they're getting all of their protein and fats from pollen and their nectar supply, supplies carbohydrates as well as free amino acids. And I'll be talking about those free amino acids later in the bumblebee life cycle and why uh, certain plants are important that are high in free amino acids. So as we already talked about, the female bees in all, in all bees, not just bumblebees, are the pollen collectors or the grocery shoppers. And bumblebees have been called generalists. And what that means is we've always thought that they, because they have this long colony cycle throughout the growing season, and they're producing uh, they have queens and workers and males that are out foraging on different plants. We always assumed that bumblebees would just visit any and all plants that they could uh, physically access the resources from. Uh, there's some new research by Robert Gugier in Massachusetts that's demonstrating that each bumblebee species of the 51 species we have in the U.S., um, they, they're not generalists. They have their own sort of suite of plants that they prefer to collect pollen from and their own suite of plants that they like to get nectar from. I'll touch a little bit about that on that a little bit later. I also want to mention because many of you are already uh, native plant enthusiasts and one of the really neat things about the evolutionary relationship between native bees and native plants is approximately 25% of the solitary bees, this doesn't include bumblebees, in the eastern U.S are pollen collecting specialists. And what that means is those solitary female bees will only collect pollen from sometimes just a single plant family. Often it's the Asteraceae family. And even there's even more narrow specialists that only collect pollen from a single plant genus. So that's one reason why native plants are so important for all of our native bees. And uh, if you're on social media and every spring, uh, there's a bunch of memes that go around and people are touting the um, benefits of dandelion, saying that it's the first flower to bloom in the spring. And that's not the case whatsoever where I live in the upper Midwest and I believe in many, many other parts of the Northern US. Uh, we have uh, native shrubs such as willow, red maple trees that bloom long before dandelions. What's important to remember is dandelions can be an adequate nectar source for bees. Uh, and I'm not telling you to go use herbicide and spray all your dandelions in your lawn, but they're not the be all and end all. You can't just say I've got spring covered because I have dandelions blooming. And what uh, the information I have on this slide is demonstrating that dandelions have a very, they're, not, they're nutritionally poor. The pollen has a low protein content. so couple of studies looked at if they could rear honeybee larvae on just dandelion pollen, and they found that they weren't able to rear them to adulthood because, it's, because the pollen was so nutritionally poor. So it's important to think about native plants for helping native bees, and particularly uh, for bumblebees, early spring as well as fall are critical times. So let's take a look at the bumblebee nest. So it's established in the spring by a queen. And queens, um, now I'm gonna sort of, let's go back, roll back the clock to early spring. Uh, you're out in your garden and you may see this really large bumblebee and that's going to be a queen. The queens are always 
larger than the workers of the same species. And that's illustrated here on this, in this photo. So he, the queen does all the egg laying in the nest. And then once she produces that first generation of workers, which are females, they begin helping her to uh, go out and forage in the landscape, collect nectar. The queen, um, much like a honeybee queen, has the ability to produce wax. And so she'll make uh, wax nectar pots, and you can see those in this photo. So when a foraging worker comes back, she's uh, stored nectar in her crop, and then she'll regurgitate it back into a nectar pot. This is kind of like uh, a refrigerator, but without the refrigeration, but a food store, a root cellar. And so when a queen bumblebees are there alone before they produce that first generation in the spring, having those nectar pots really help them survive, especially if we have really wet, rainy weather for two weeks straight, and she's not able to go out and collect all and feed for herself. So she has some food stores inside the nest. The nectar pots get reinvented sometimes and become um, uh, area filled with pollen and then eggs are laid on the pollen to produce offspring. So bumblebee nests are not as tidy as a honeybee hive, if you've seen the honeybee hive with the hexagonal cells and all neat and same perfect size. <laughs> Bumblebee nests are a little messy and sort of organic and uh, grow and do all these changes of what nectar pots are used for over the growing season. So just to give you a window inside of what's going on in a bumblebee nest. Now where do bumblebee nests occur? Um, depending on where you're tuning in from, in the northern part of our U.S., uh, bumblebees, the, female, the queens are going to be establishing a nest somewhere where it provides insulation because they're usually emerging as early as April or sometimes late March. And with re really cool nighttime temperatures, they're seeking out some place with insulation. This is a restoration site just after we started restoring it. And this year, uh, I found two bumblebee nests, which is unusual, uh, within five feet of each other. So one was located at the end of a rotting log, and the second was just um, underneath some heavy leaf litter and plant debris. And you would never would have known the bumblebee nests were there. The reason I discovered them is I, I pulled the weed, and I heard a buzzing sound, and I immediately knew, oh, that sounds like bumblebees and then after sitting and observing I started to see the workers coming and going and that was in midsummer. Um, bumblebees also the, the also look for abandoned rodent holes so again some place below ground that is providing insulation. Now if you live further south uh, you may find nests that are established above ground. Sometimes people find bumblebee nests in abandoned bird nest boxes for example. Uh, underneath a shed. Uh, often they may be seeking out the females, queens will be using olfactory smells and looking for old mouse nests. So anywhere you, a mouse nest may occur could be a future site for a bumblebee nest. And spring is a really critical time here. So we'll just kind of go through the annual life cycle of bumblebees here. So those um, the colony produces, uh, they start with producing workers, which are the daughters or females. And then the second, um, I'm not gonna, the second species or gender that they produce are the males. And then at the end of the colony cycle, they start to produce new queens. And the new queens are called gynes. And they are the ones that, um, the only bumblebees to survive for that annual colony and they overwinter. So in the early spring when you see these large bumblebees, these are females that have been hibernating all winter. And similarly they will be looking for an insulated place um, and below ground in a rodent hole under a heavy layer of leaf litter for example, but some, some place that's going to provide a little bit of insulation and protection. And so each of the Bumblebee species will have has a different seasonal phenology. So we have some species that come out earlier than others. This is a two-spotted bumblebee, which is very common in the eastern US and one of the earliest emerging species. So here's a, a new queen or kind. She hasn't established a colony yet, but she needs to find some adequate 
sources of nectar and she's uh, sipping nectar from a pussy willow flower. So she probably just emerged from hibernation. She's depleted all of her energies and fat stores during hibernation. So she needs to replenish those calories lost so she has enough energy to look for a nest. And once um, she has established a nest or she's doing nest searching, and that's something to look for in early spring. If you see large bumblebees, they can spend up to five to 12 days searching for an ideal nesting site. I call them Cinderella's sometimes. I've, I have followed queens around looking for nests and they will do a lot of investigation. They may look at um, holes in, in the ground or if you have a, a rock or re retaining wall, for example, they may investigate the cavities between the rocks but it takes, it takes a lot of time for them to come to the final choice of where they, where they uh, want to nest. Once they've established a nest, the, the queens still have all the, all the uh, onus to go out and forage for pollen and nectar. So they not only are trying to keep themselves alive and have calories by visiting flowering plants, such as the ones I have on the slide. These are uh, nectar plants that you'll typically see queens visiting. And so she's just building up energy while she's uh, getting ready to start laying eggs. The, the second piece that's really important for queens is pollen sources. So in order to produce that first generation, she needs to create that large pollen ball that you saw on the nest slide, lay multiple eggs on that, and then that will, that's where her first generation of females or workers uh, consume that pollen and, and develop. So in our gardens and landscapes, we really don't see a lot of bumblebees for that period of time between when the queens are active and doing their nest searching and maybe you'll catch them visiting a flower, then there's a lull. And then once that first generation of workers are produced, the females, uh, then bumblebee activity tends to pick up in our landscapes. So in, where I live in the upper Midwest, that's not usually until the end of June or mid-June, we start to see uh, bumblebee workers coming out. The workers, again, are smaller than the queens uh, of the same species. So they'd be a little bit tinier, but this is obviously a female. She's got a very big pollen load on her hind legs as she's visiting purple prairie clover. And so this is where pollen, pollen plants are really important. And these are some examples of perennials that either queens or workers will be collecting pollen from. Um, going back to buzz pollination, buzz pollination isn't only used for plants that have inverted anthers like the blueberries. Uh, many of our native plants are nectarless. So some examples on this slide are the partridge pea, St. John's wort and spider wort, they're all nectarless plants. And you will hear, if you have good hearing, you'll hear bumblebees uh, buzz pollinating those flowers to extract the pollen. So these are all pollen sources for the, for the bumblebees, whether it's a queen or worker. So very important um, piece to think about in your garden. So they have that pollen so that they can start um, producing more and more offspring. And so it's not just perennial, some of our early spring flowering shrubs will also be good pollen sources, especially uh, currants, uh, blackberries, raspberries, dewberries provide a good pollen source, uh, native blueberries and cranberries, spirea, and, as well as the plums. And the big one, another one that's uh, nectarless is our native roses. So I planted um, a smooth wild rose, Rose blonda in one of my restoration sites. And that is a hive of activity of bumblebees and other smaller solitary native bees in the morning. So you have to get out in the morning to hear them uh, going to the flowers, buzz pollinating and watching them collect the pollen because by noon, if you were to um, visit that plant thinking you'd see, see bees after noon, that's not the case whatsoever. All the pollen has been extracted uh, in the morning hours. Something to keep in mind about when you're doing your observations and to vary it so you catch all of these things going on. And then uh, workers have specific nectar plants. So they're not only um, consuming and storing nectar in their crop, 
uh, to take back to the bumblebee nest to deposit in one of those nectar pots. Um, they also just need it for fuel and energy. So they're selectively going to different plants. A lot of the time plants in the mint family. So some examples on this slide, uh, the monarda or wild bergamot, mountain mints, uh, in addition, vervains, which are sort of mint-like, but in a different family, and hyssop. Those are all really good nectar plants for bumblebees. And some of, for example, the turtle heads, they have uh, thing, uh, components inside the nectar other than the sugar, the glucose or fructose, the sugars, uh, secondary met metabolic compounds that actually have been shown to help bumblebees heal if they've been exposed to pesticides. So many of our native plants have some uh, healing properties. Uh, so now the colony has produced maybe one or two generations of females or workers and now we get into midsummer, and that's when we start to see some males coming out. And for the for native bees, this doesn't just include bumblebees. Uh, for all native bees, when uh, males are, uh, become adults and leave the nest. They, they never return to the nest. So they're out in the landscape doing their thing. They have much shorter lifespan than females, um, typically two to three weeks. And their sole purpose in life is finding a female. And many of our male species, uh, including this black and gold bumblebee I have on this slide, or another example is the brown belted bumblebee. They, they can have really large eyes. And what he's doing with his large eyes is setting up a perch or a territory on, on top of a tall plant in a prairie. And you can see his antenna are sticking straight out. So he's using the sen sensory apparatus on his antenna to pick up smells or other um, sensory things to see if there's a, a new queen out and about. And he will chase off doing sort of boomerang flights. He'll chase off other males to, um, to keep them out of his territory that he's established. So uh, males are, they have to fuel these mate searching activities. And similarly, they have their own suite of nectar plants. And they're the, sometimes the nectar plants that they prefer, the male bumblebees versus the females, um, can be very different. The Monarda is an exception. You'll find any and all uh, genders of bumblebees visiting Monarda. But you can see on the slide for the plant geeks uh, listening in, bumblebee males tend to like plants in the aster family. So cone flowers, thistles, uh, goldenrods, asters, smooth oxide, those are all at, um, in the aster family. And then you also see certain bumblebee species preferentially going to milkweed. So it's about brown belted bumblebee is, is visiting common milkweed. So males are not consuming pollen, just nectar, and nectar is helping to just keep them going long enough. Okay, so males are out, and now this is where we're just after male production, the colony starts producing new queens, and these are the gynes. And the new queens, um, they have a little bit different lifestyle. So they, they leave the nest during the day. And what they do is they practice foraging. So this is a rusty patch queen visiting blazing star flowers. And what she is selectively going to plants that have a good nectar source because she needs to build up fat stores. Uh, to survive her hibernation in the winter. And the, this sort of pre-hibernation feeding can go on anywhere from approximately 12 days. And while the females are out doing this practicing, they go back to the colony where they were raised at night. So they do this for about 12 days. And while they're out visiting flowers, building up their fat stores, that's when the males uh, usually find them and mating occurs. And uh, there's some physiological changes that happen once the female has consumed enough calories and started to build, build up enough fat stores. At some point in time, she decides that she's not going back to the nest. She's going to go off and, and search for her place where she will overwinter. And so the native perennials in late summer in our gardens in early fall are critical for these gynes. And the ones that I have shown on the slide, many of them have nectar that is, has high free amino acid concentrations. And it's those free amino acids, as well as the sugars in the nectar that help 
those new queens build their fat stores. So, um, for example, Leatris and um, the goldenrod are excellent in very good plants to have in your garden to support new bumblebee queens. And then uh, that's when the males find the females. And you can see the, the size difference between a male and female. Males are much smaller, much like the workers are smaller than the queens. <laughs> Sometimes it's rather hilarious to see the size difference of them trying to mate, but <laughs> um, that's the case. And so the females or the que new queens are so busy trying to build fat stores that they, they uh, generally put up with the uh, mating attempts by the males while they're out in, in the landscape. All right, I want to get quickly into some bumblebee anatomy to roll up our sleeves and start thinking about some how to begin with BID and starting with bumblebees. And bumblebees, like uh, many insects, have three distinct parts of their body, uh, including the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Now, the abdomen uh, on bees is divided in either six or seven segments. So on this slide, this is a female. Females have uh, six ab abdominal segments, and males have seven. So that's one um, physiological difference between a male and a female. The, the second one that I've already talked about is males lack pollen collecting structures. So the, their hind legs for bumblebees that, that hind tibia where the females have the flared tibia, which is the pollen basket, males have very skinny hind legs because the tibia is not flared. Uh, so this is really important if you're trying to differentiate, if you're looking at bumblebees, is it a male or female? And if you get a good photograph or a good observation, you can usually count the number of abdominal segments. And the abdominal segments are important because they're each uh, covered in different hair colors, per, depending on the species. Uh, and then bumblebees, the couple of other things to think about if you're doing more extensive ID, uh, the malar space, which is the space between the, the bottom of the compound eye and where the mandible begins is often used. Uh, the size or the length of the malar space is used for many species. Um, also the simple eyes, so those, three small eyes on the top of the head that bees and wasps have that helps them um, detect sunlight and helps orient them back to their nest. So bumblebees, when they leave, uh, are using those simple eyes to figure out where the nest is location based on the direction of the sun so that they go out and forage for the morning, collect their pollen, and are able to come back and find the nest. So just a, some simple anatomy to get us started here. Um, these illustrations are from Elaine Evans' Minnesota Guide. They're, they're also used by the Xerxes Society. And when you start using the printed illustrations such as this, if you're doing Bumblebee ID, a couple of things that are more subtle and to keep in mind is the um, color of the hairs on the, on the face. So you can see on this example of the two spotted bumblebee, the hairs are colored black and on the on the back of the head or the neck uh, on this illustration the hairs are yellow so uh, depending on the species sometimes the queen the male or the queen the male and the worker can look exactly the same but in many cases the queen can have a different coloration pattern than the worker and the male so uh, Elaine has for example um, both a male and female guide, but not a guide for the queens. And you have to do a little bit more digging on some other guides to find uh, the queen guide. But I'm going to start with the most common species in the eastern U.S., the two-spotted bumblebee. It's a stable species, so it's um, not in, believed not to be in decline. And it's called the two-spotted because on the second abdominal segment, there are, in the middle section, there are yellow hairs that sometimes form two lobes. And in some cases, it's just uh, the middle section of the, like in the bottom image of the worker, is, it has yellow hairs. And this is probably the second most common species in the, in the eastern U.S., the common eastern bumblebee. The one, I think, of all native bumblebees, the, the one that is most observed by people on citizen scientists' websites. 
And so just tying in with her illustration and what's, what's shown in the images, you can see uh, for the worker, black hairs on the face. What's really unique about the common Eastern bumblebee versus many other bumblebees, they, they don't have a distinct uh, black dot on their thorax. So if I go back to the previous slide, you can see that very distinct black spot on the queen in the upper image in the middle of her thorax. Uh, common eastern bumblebees have very hazy black spot, it's not distinct, and they also have fairly light colored wings. And the, this is the bumblebee that gets confused with the eastern carpenter bee because e similarly the eastern carpenter bee has yellow hairs on the first segment and then black for the rest. Uh, the eastern Com carpenter bee, however, has uh, a very shiny black abdomen and lacking as much hairs as what's shown here on the common eastern bumblebee. The third species we'll take a look at is the brown belted. Where I live in the Midwest, where we still have uh, populations of the federally endangered rusty patch bumblebee, uh, many people get excited because they'll see a brown belted bumblebee, which are quite common and think it's the rusty patch. And um, the brown belted bumblebee has yellow hairs on that first abdominal segment and then sort of a moon, half moon or swoop shape. Uh, br rusty brown hairs on the second segment. I'll show you rusty patch so you can compare the difference on a following slide, but this is the one species I mentioned along with the black and gold bumblebee. The males have really large eyes and all the better to find a female with, of course. And this is a, the black and gold bumblebee. So as far as physical size of all of our bumblebee species, this is one of our largest uh, bumblebees, even the workers can be much larger than the queens of some other species. My, my good friend Michelle calls the flying bears and they really are astounding um, and surprise people just based on how big they are and they def simply defy physics <laughs> being able to fly. Um, they look similar, so if you're familiar with the American bumblebee Bombus pensylvanicus, the two can be really difficult to tell apart, particularly where their ranges overlap. Um, the black and gold bumblebee tends to have yellow hairs on the back of the thorax. And the uh, other significant thing to look for is the position of the simple eyes. So this is where you would have to gently catch or capture a bumblebee and look up close and then let her go to, to determine whether you have a, a black and gold or a, an American bumblebee. So we have a, a number of bumblebee species in decline. I showed you those, those species that I just showed you are relatively stable and common. And in some cases, the populations are increasing. But for the rest of our bumblebee species, uh, most of them are in decline. And the one that has had the most precipitous decline is the federally endangered rusty patch bumblebee. So you can see uh, uh, prior to about 2010, this bee ranged throughout much of eastern, north, north, northeastern, North America and the upper Midwest. It was one of the most common species found in surveys. And then um, in 2010, it just literally disappeared from the province of Ontario and Michigan. And part of the reason why it's in decline is because a pathogen was introduced from managed bumblebees that was being used in greenhouse uh, tomato and pepper production in southern Ontario and in Michigan. So those um, domesticated managed bumblebee colonies escaped and got out into the wild and spread the pathogen. But it's not just the pathogen, of course, for many of our native bees in decline, it's uh, habitat loss and just lack of adequate amount of flowering plants. So rusty patch, we'll see what happens with the rusty patch. We had a, anecdotally a very good pretty good year here in Minnesota as far as their population, but we won't know more until the experts can analyze all of the seasonal data and survey data. So bumblebees are, yeah, they're, they're being hit very hard, uh, similarly to a lot of our other 
native fauna. Um, some of the things, things that are really concerning are nutritional stress. And so climate change is a big unknown. And we know that plants are not producing pollen of the same quality or of nutrition as they were historically. So even if we were to have a native plant community that had the same plants in it that was uh, occurred a hundred years ago, bees would, would have had much more nutritional components in the same flowering plants. Um, besides pests and pathogens, which don't impact native bees as much as the domesticated honeybee, the other big one, of course, is pesticide use in the landscape, habitat loss, and then there's growing concern now about competition from introduced non-native species, including honeybees, and how that may be stressing uh, our native bumblebees. So it's no, uh, there's no reason to get <laughs> depressed about the landscape because these are some really drastic examples of where we could do a whole lot better. And I think, I think of commercial landscapes and residential landscapes in particular as being um, really important ways that we can easily influence homeowners and people who are managing commercial sites. That's a target parking lot in my community. Um, why aren't we just need to think a little bit differently about how what plants we're planting and how the, the landscapes are managed. So habitat loss is, a, is something that we can solve and it starts with um, individuals and I'll get into a little bit more about that in a couple slides here. But climate change, as I mentioned, is a big unknown. So if we're having warmer winters, those queens, those new queens that are hibernating may be, they're taking different phenological cues, not just day length, daylight, um, but also if they're hibernating below ground, they may be using soil temperatures as a cue to, to emerge. And for example, last spring here in where I live in the upper Midwest, we had a really wet and cold rainy spring for two, two to three weeks. So that can have really be impactful for a new queen if she's just established a colony and then she's unable to go out and forage and uh, collect pollen and nectar because of the weather. Bumblebees uh, will also be impacted by increasing temperatures and one study uh, looked at whether bumblebees would move, species would move north as temperatures warm or in um, high altitudes whether they would move up in altitude and uh, they found that that's not the case. So they're, they're, they're remaining, the populations are remaining static even though our climate is warming and changing. So that's one concern um, how they will be impacted. How can you help bumblebees? Well, I know many of you here are already uh, landscaping with native plants, maybe on, the, in, on your home, uh, home garden level or you're doing restorations on a larger scale. And that's exactly how we can help bumblebees as well as our other native bees. The obvious thing that we need to provide them is native plants. And that includes a diversity of different flowering plants. So the ones that I highlighted here this evening, um, but in general, if you wanna serve, serve up food or have the restaurant open for all native bees, you need a variety of flower colors and flower forms and you need a continuous succession, succession of flowering plants throughout the growing season. So thinking about early spring as an important time of year for those new queens to have good sources of pollen because they need that pollen in order to produce their first generation of offspring. And then getting into summer and fall that the nectar plants are going to serve the workers as well as the new queens and the males. So we can do this in combination of planting flowering trees, flowering shrubs, and perennials. Often people think we forget about the, the woody plants and the importance that they provide for pollinators, particularly in early spring. So I always re remind people in early spring, don't forget to look up. So if you're looking for, if you're a pollinator observer and you're looking down at the ground expecting to see activity, sometimes all the bees are up in the trees because uh, for those trees that are insect pollinated, um, they can be very good sources of pollen and nectar for our native bees. And finally, if you uh, plant a beautiful native plant landscape, this is the garden of our chapter president, Marilyn Torkelson. 
Um, you don't want to provide all these beautiful flowering plants flowering throughout the growing season, all these different flower colors and continue to use pesticides. So you don't want to make your garden a pollinator sink. And that's exactly what you'd be doing if Marilyn went out and started spraying all our plants with pesticides. So if we're going to commit to helping pollinators, we got to leave the, leave the chemical bottles on the shelf and not, not use them in our landscapes. And we have to think a little bit differently about managing landscapes. So I just showed you a couple of examples where bumblebee nests may occur, but thinking about uh, not doing a whole lot of gardening in fall because those queens may have tucked themselves underneath leaf litter in your garden to hibernate. They may have been attracted to a rodent hole, so don't put poison down rodent holes. Um, so all of those sort of messier, what we would call messier components if we were a a very tidy gardener are important things to have to attract bumblebees uh, to, for overwintering and for potential nesting sites. And finally, I know many of you always already do this, but it's important to continue to advocate for the preservation and restoration of our native plant communities. This is the state park in, in, in Minnesota where I live. It's a beautiful dry sand prairie. Uh, it's protected, and these are the spaces that really support rare native bee species and also support our bumblebees that are in decline. So we have to continue to advocate that these are spaces are preserved as well as converting land and restoring it to the native plant communities that used to be there or may be more resilient in the future. These are the resources that I mentioned that Matt or uh, Pam will send you or post. So don't worry about scribbling all these down uh, for those that are watching the recording. Um, this is more for, for them if they want to look at the links. So I've got some citizen scientist opportunities, Bumblebee Watch, iNaturalist or two that you can upload photos of bumblebees that you've taken and then experts will help you identify them to species. If you live out east near Massachusetts, there's a wonderful project called the Beecology Project. And that is the oh, this is Ted, it looks like. project. And he you will be helping him sort of determine what are the specific native plant needs for each bumblebee species? What are their pollen plants and what are their nectar plants? And there's a number of resources for the um, bumblebee identification as well that are in those links that will be sent out to you. So thank you so much for tuning in and sticking with me. I hope you learned uh, a little bit about bumblebees this evening. And I look forward to seeing you in person at some point in time post COVID. <laughs> Well, Heather, this is the time where we get a chance to answer some questions. But first, I want to thank you for a thrilling presentation. And uh, we learned a lot today and had a great time. But we had a couple of questions that were asked by our guests but that they sent in ahead of time. And one of them relates directly to what you were talking about at the end with um, the relationship between bumblebees and manicuring your landscape. But T. Shipley asked the question, what happens when a bumblebee makes a nest in my compost pile. Yeah, that's a tough one because once that queen has decided after a week or so of being picky <laughs> and she's chosen your compost pile, there's really not much you can do. Um, you, would, you really have to just leave it alone for the growing season. And I know that's not what um, the person asking the question wanted to hear, but there's been many attempts to relocate bumblebee nests, and usually that's, that's not a successful endeavor. So remember I talked about orientation and bumblebees uh, using those simple eyes and other cues to help them find the nest or know where the nest is so that when they come back, they can find the nest. So if we were to just suddenly relocate the nest, uh, you would have a lot of very confused bumblebee workers flying around wondering uh, where the nest went. So that's one reason why nest relocation is really difficult. What you can do though, if it's early in the growing season is contact your local university bee lab. And sometimes they will come and collect the queen and the nest 
and use that in the lab for study. And then so the, the, the colony would be growing in the lab. So that's one way that you can help researchers and not, not destroy the nest. Sounds like a great idea. Uh, we had a couple questions about stinging. And as, as uh, Donna had asked, as I work in the garden, I get up close and personal with many of the pollinators. Are there specific pollinators that are more likely to sting me? And are bumblebees one of those pollinators that could sting me? So all bees uh, and, and wasps for that matter, um, just the females have a stinger or sting and have the ability to sting. Now it's important to remember um, when any bee is at the restaurant, so visiting flowering plants, consuming food or collecting food or at the grocery store, um, they really have no interest whatsoever in stinging. Generally, when someone is stung, it's when um, they've disturbed a nest, um, or the second usually situation is a bee flies, uh, flies uh, at you and maybe gets caught in your clothing and in its own defense just stings you because it's trying to escape from being caught in your shirt, for example. So usually uh, stinging is not an intentional thing that bees go and seek out to do. <laughs> um, but they, particularly for the social species like bumblebees and honeybees, they, they really resent having their nests disturbed. And can you blame them, right? It's a home invasion. <laughs> exactly. So that's, that's what you want to avoid. Yeah. Uh, I just want to share the poll results real briefly. Uh, the region of the country that was most well represented is is where I'm originally from and where you're at in the Midwest with 70% of our attendees coming from the Midwest, followed by the South with 15%, Northeast with 10%, and 5% of you, five of you from out West. 73% of tonight's attendees are currently Wild One members, which is great. 20% are not, 5% are not, but would love to be, and we would be very happy to have you join us, and 2% of you are not sure. Uh, one great way to find out if you are a Wild One member is to reach out uh, to us on our website and try to get into the members area to see if your membership has recently lapsed. Or you might have gotten an email letting you know that. How long have you been gardening? It sounds like a lot of people are relatively new with zero to five years being the number one choice with 35% of those in attendance that are relatively new to gardening with native plants zero to five years. We've got 16% that have more than 20 years, so that's exciting. And the age group uh, that was uh, most well represented are those that are 40 years to 65 years and over 65 years. And we had 1% of you that are under 25. The um, uh, other category, 25 to 40 years, is at 8%. So thank you all for taking the poll. I have a couple more questions for you, Heather. Um, I wanted to find out on behalf of Mulhaney, what, what can I do to encourage bumblebees to build nests in my yard? And I know you had a couple uh, mentions to stumps and the mulch layer, but are there other things that you could do to really encourage bumblebees to see our yards as a place to raise their young? Yeah, as I mentioned, the the mess the messier the better. <laughs> um, but uh, and the the other thing I've probably already said as well is they they are picky. <laughs> so I've pleaded with bumblebees to nest in my yard to no avail. <laughs> um, but uh, again, they are often attracted to old mouse nests. So okay. one, one thing I did this spring in one of my restoration sites is I went around to my neighbors with a five gallon bucket and said, hey, do you have old mouse nests? And, and sure enough, uh, my neighbor had one in his um, irrigation box in his lawn. So I, I pulled those materials out and then I put them in the restoration site. Uh, you can buy um, bumblebee nest boxes, which are wood boxes that you would bury below ground. For, from what I've heard, most people don't have any success with them. But if you can finagle some mouse nest materials and put it somewhere that looks like a good place for a bumblebee to nest, that may help attract them. Thank you. Uh, one, one other question here from John Mitchell. How do you get them to stay still long enough to be able to photograph and identify them? Are you truly the bee whisperer or is there a <laughs> tactic that you that you follow to make sure that you get those crisp, clean, 
beautiful images. Well, yeah, it takes a lot of practice. Um, so especially, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but those queens in the spring are particularly skittish. And I was helping with some blueberry pollination research and we couldn't get within 20 feet of bumblebees and they would be off and away. Um, so the, the queens in the spring, forget it. <laughs> That's why I have so few photos of them in the spring. Um, but what, what you want to keep in mind if you're photographing is uh, fluid and slow movements. So anything erratic or uh, walking up quickly to a flower that you see a bumblebee on, that's going to for sure chase them off. So you just have to think differently about your movements. Uh, standing quietly in front of a flowering plant that you know bumblebees will visit and having your camera ready often works better than um, walking around frequently and looking for them. So mm -hmm. uh, I would just practice those things. One tip um, if you're just starting with photography is to turn your flash on. That sometimes helps with capturing, uh, slowing down movement and getting more depth of field. And, and try and get as many shots as you can of different angles of the bumblebee so that you can ensure that if you were to upload it to Bumblebee Watch or iNaturalist, um, the experts have enough angles to help you get it identified properly. Great. And I have a final question for you. I know we're talking a lot about bumblebees, but if there was one species of bee that we could make the most dramatic impact on and changing the way that we manage our gardens, what species would it be and what would we need to do differently? Wow, that's a good question because <laughs> there's so many species. <laughs> Um, well, I go back to, besides thinking about what bumblebee need, bumblebees need, what I've illustrated tonight, um, the other thing that we can do as native plant gardeners is to start planting more of the native plants that the specialists need. So bumblebee, some of our bumblebee species are really having a hard time with habitat loss and climate change, but our specialists are particularly vulnerable. Um, because they may be emerging later than historically average or their flowering plant that they can only collect pollen from that particular plant and be blooming at the wrong time or a different time. So if we, the more we can plant specialist plants in our landscapes, that would be, that would be really helpful for the 25% of native bees that are specialists. So one example, uh, plant a native loose stripe. We have beautiful native loose stripes. Most of them are yellow flowering in the Lysimachia genus. Mm -hmm. So that would be something to try and include in your garden, especially if you live in the eastern part of the country. And that would support a really rare uh, oil pollen collecting specialist. Very cool. Thank you very much, Heather. We, okay. wa we wanted to thank you for graciously providing us all with your time and expertise. If you haven't picked up a copy of either of her books, please make sure that you do. Uh, and they're a welcome addition to any gardener, ecologist, or entomologist library. She shared with us her social media platforms where she continues to bring the message of native pollinators and the ecological practices of encouraging them in your landscape to life. So please, if you don't already follow Heather, make sure that you do that. You see on the screen right now, we have our photography contest, which is open, and we encourage you to submit your photos of your favorite native plants in one of six categories, or all of six categories. Uh, those we will be accepting until November 1st, and there's a new interface. So there's an online form that you have to fill out, and we've already received dozens of fantastic photos. If you were a member already, which we saw most of you are, that's great, and we're really glad to have you joining us tonight. But maybe you're not a member and you're watching this as a recording or you were joining a friend tonight, please check out www.wildones.org to see all the wonderful work that our organization is doing from Seeds for Education to the support for Wild for Monarchs and our photography contest and look for future events like what you're experiencing right now. We know that there was only a small portion of the attendees tonight that are under the age of 25 and sharing our mission with kids and young adults is one way that we can further our impact and solidify native plant, native plant, uh, um, ah, sorry, our native plant mission for the future. 
So please share with a friend, a colleague, a loved one. And I also want to give a big thank you to the board and a very special thanks to Pam Todd for maintaining our technology for tonight, muting everybody, turning off your videos, and to the staff at Wild Ones for assisting with the registration and promotion of the webinar. We hope to have you join us for future programs. We encourage you to share tonight's experience on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Feel free to take a picture of yourself right now watching what's happening and share it with all of us. We hope to have made a few more advocates for our native bees out there, and we will be sending you an email with the links from tonight's presentation. This time, if you want to turn on your video and wave goodnight to everybody, please do so at this time. Otherwise, we wish you a great evening, a great weekend, and thanks again for being members and future members of Wild Ones. Good night, everybody. <laughs>